good evening to all uh, let us start with the uh, sixth live session on this payment materials in the today's live session uh, we would be discussing about the assignment five questions uh, which you have already uh, submitted and also the quick summary of the week 6 followed by few numericals uh, involving the uh, week 6 lessons if you could have seen the week by assignment questions the first basic question which all of us uh, have known is a uh, bitumen is derived from either the coal or is it from tar or petroleum or coke so it is an easy question it is a derived product from petroleum from the fractional distillation process and if you come to the second question the api gravity of water at 23 degrees is equal to so is my screen visible to everyone you can type in the chat box is the slide with second question is visible or is the slide is still the first question can somebody reply in the chat box okay is the second question visible okay let me reshare the screen okay now i think so the api gravity of water at 23 degrees is equal to so it is a very simple question here is the api gravity equation i think the slides are not loading i cannot see the second slide uh, coming to you let me reshare the slides
it is because of the internet actually it is not uh, getting shared Okay, this is the second question. So, we already knew uh, the formula for API gravity is uh, this in which we just need to know the specific gravity of water. Uh, so here, uh, as they haven't mentioned any further details, uh, we can assume the specific gravity of uh, water at 23 degrees as the one. So by substituting uh, that uh, specific gravity as one, uh, we can get the API gravity value as 10. And if we come to the third question, where the excessive high pressure applied on the long residue can lead to. So we know that uh, when we have the petroleum uh, under this fractional uh, distillation process, the first residue after uh, after subjecting this petroleum into the higher pressures more than the atmospheric pressure at higher temperatures is what we call as the long residue. So when we subject this long residue to the excessive higher pressures, that residue will be converted into the short residue under the conditions of thermal regradation. So this is the question which they are asking. So what will happen when we subject this long residue to higher pressures? They will be undergoing thermal degradation. So for a given bitumen, which of the following solvent will have higher yield of asphaltines? So in order to understand whether a bitumen will have higher yield of asphaltines, saturates or which kind of uh, 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 part. So, if you could have remembered, so we have SARA fractions, saturates, aromatics, resins and asphaltines. So, the first two are the oily fractions and the second two are the polar fractions which are nothing but the, they impose the stiffness to the binder. So, how do I know in the given bitumen, uh, how much amount of saturates are there, asphaltines are there that we perform using chromatographic study. So, in this chromatographic study, usually we take the solvents and we keep our bitumen into that solvent. So, when we use a different kind of solvent, we can see that precipitates of each part will be coming out. 
So here in this question, we have n-heptanes, n-pentanes, tolines, and trichloroethylene. These are different kinds of solvents. So if we wanted to have high yield of asphaltines, asphaltines are usually uh, insoluble. Thereby, they can get precipitated when the bitumen is uh, mixed with the n-pentane. So when you use the n-pentane, you can uh, see that the most amount of precipitate can be observed. The higher amount of saturates in bitumen can lead to. So as we have discussed already, saturates and aromatics, the first two, SA are usually the oily fractions. They make this uh, asphaltines to be floated uh, sufficiently in the bitumen. So the amount of saturates and the asphaltines, their ratio is completely important. We do not want more amount of saturates. The more the amount of oily fractions, the bitumen will not have proper stiffness. So it leads to the temperature susceptibility, which means the properties of bitumen would be changing with temperature very significantly. Thereby increasing the amount of saturates uh, will lead to the increase in temperature susceptibility. So why is this 60 degrees is used for the measurement of absolute viscosity? So we have chosen this uh, 60 degrees because 60 degrees usually is the average maximum payment temperature especially during summers. So when the viscosity grading was uh, given especially at United States during the uh, summer season the highest temperature was 60 degrees considered. Even in India, we consider 60 degrees as a corresponding maximum summer temperature or payment temperature. So in the temperature susceptibility method proposed by the two others, the penetration of bitumen at softening point is assumed to be. So usually uh, this is a temperature susceptibility method. So we calculate the penetration index. So here the penetration of the bitumen at softening point in default, they assume it as 800, but we also have discussed that in any condition, if we wanted to understand what is the penetration of the vitamin at this opening point, we can still perform at that temperature also, but in default, we assume it as 800. And this is also an easiest question. So we have two binders, binder A and binder B. So both the binders have the viscosity range 3000 to 3400. And the penetration index of A is given as 0 0.7, but the penetration index of B is given as 0 0.5. So higher the penetration index, that means higher is the temperature susceptibility. When I say higher temperature susceptibility, its properties would be changing with change in temperature very significantly. We do not want our material to change its properties with change in temperature. It can change insignificantly, but not higher significance. Thereby, if you see the type of vitamin B, it has lesser penetration index, which implies that lesser susceptibility. Okay. So, we can choose vitamin B. I think uh, participants can unmute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, madam, so yes, during the presentation in the video, it is mentioned that as far as possible, we should select the softer grade of the bitumen. Softer grade of the bitumen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet lower temperature. So uh, penetration index of the 0.7 is the softer compared to the 0.5. Okay. So uh, usually. So that's why mm -hmm. I have chosen the answer A. And in your, uh, you are talking about the temperature susceptibility, higher temperature, it will be more temperature susceptible. So usually penetration of uh, lesser value is uh, uh, not preferable. Penetration of higher value is preferable. Let hmm. us say at 25 degrees, uh, Sar has discussed that at hmm. 25 degrees, it is better to have higher penetration. Hmm. Higher penetration means bitumen is soft at 25 degrees. So, if the bitumen is soft at 25 degrees, we can avoid the intermediate cracking or fatty cracking. Mm -hmm. So, we recommend to choose higher penetration values at 25 degrees, but mm -hmm. as far as the penetration index is considered. So, this penetration index is the ratio of penetration at 4 degrees to penetration at 25 degrees. Uh -huh. So, this penetration index is different from the penetration. 
this index should be lowest possible that means so from 4 degrees to 25 degrees the change in properties are not that much variable so okay. this a and b having 0.7 0.5 is like a slope so a is having more slope 0.7 means b is having less slope higher the slope means higher the susceptibility but penetration should be uh, lesser penetration uh, penetration should be higher that means soft bitumen is preferable at 25 degrees but penetration index should be lowest possible Oh, okay. And this is also a standard question where, as per the super pair specification, the viscosity of bitumen at 135 degrees should be less than 3 pascal second. That all of us know at 135 degrees is a mixing temperature. So, we wanted to handle our bitumen uh, uh, more than 100 degrees temperature. So, at that temperature, we do not want our bitumen to be more stiffer. So, we wanted our bitumen to have lesser viscosity, which is less than 3 pascal second. And if we come to this uh, week 6 summary, uh, we will not be going in detail because, uh, you know, most of the concepts have a detailed uh, uh, derivations, which SAR has already discussed. But let us discuss briefly what uh, has been discussed and see how far we can able to cover. So, the mainly this entire week is based upon the viscoelasticity of the bitumen. We know viscoelasticity is nothing but any bitumen or any material which is having the properties of both viscous and also elastic. Elastic materials we already know. So, uh, like in the steel structures or strength of materials. So, we always uh, determine the strength of the elastic materials using elastic modulus, capital E. So, this elastic modulus is always assumed to be constant because it is independent of the stress, this is the ratio of stress to strain, so independent of change in strain. But when it comes to the viscous materials, for example, like water, so these viscous materials, they keep changing their properties, they do not have a single property. So, their uh, stiffness is not like elastic modulus, their stiffness keeps changing uh, as you change the strain rate. So, our bitumen is that kind of material which has the properties of both elastic and also viscous. So, in order to understand the properties of the bitumen, we assume that spring as a representation of the elastic uh, properties and also dashpot as a representation of viscous. And we already know this thing that uh, strain is equal to stress by elastic modulus for elastic materials, strain rate equal to the stress by this is the viscosity of the material. So, as I have already mentioned that this modulus whether it is elastic modulus or shear modulus, this value should not change uh, with change in strain. So, if I have a material, I am applying the load, let us say stress has been applied. So, when I apply some stress, what happens? Either material will bend or material will undergo some deformation. That is nothing but strain. So, if I want to understand the strength of the material, stress by strain. Let us say E is a value which I am observing now. But what happens if I apply different values? Let us say sigma 2 you observe different strain that will be E2. So, your modulus keep on changing. So, every time if you want to represent the stiffness of the bitter, you have to represent corresponding to this stress, corresponding to this strain, I have this material property as E. But if you take the elastic materials, the stress to strain ratio is always constant. Okay, This ratio is constant. That means the material is in linear regime. So, if the material is not in linear regime, what happens? The behavior will be non-linear. Then we cannot understand, it is very complex to understand the behavior of the material. And most of our analysis in this entire lecture, especially on bituminous, will be done under linear viscoelastic regime. So, we wanted to keep our material to be within the linear, linear viscoelastic regime and then observe the properties. So, we try to apply the load in such a way that material will not undergo complete damage. 
so that is what we call as linear viscoelastic regime so this graph you could have seen already in the videos let us say strain is 10% here strain is 3% here the strain is less than 1% so as you increase the strain from 1 to 10% that means when i say strain i am actually shearing the material 1% means i am shearing with little strain 3% means little more strain 10% means i am shearing with something more strain as i increase the strain material will be damaged quickly and it will reach from linear viscoelastic regime to non linear viscoelastic regime so before conducting any experiment on the binder first we have to confirm what is that maximum strain beyond which my material will be undergoing to non linear regime so i have to avoid that uh, strain percent i have to test my material below that so that it is completely useful for us to analyze the binder Uh, in 100%. So all the existing theories, most of the theories which we are going to discuss now, are applicable for linear viscoelastic regime. This is one of the reason why we wanted to keep our material to be within the linear viscoelastic regime, so that all the existing theories will be applicable to understand the behavior. And at the same time, at the end, most of our interest is asphalt mixtures. here uh, as a binder we wanted to understand its physical basic physical and rheological properties especially in the linear viscoelastic regime so one of the theory that is available for the linear viscoelastic materials is boltzmann superposition principle so according to this principle let us say if you have any material now the bitumen so i have sub i have applied a strain of delta t1 to that bitumen so after a particular time i have applied delta t2 so when i apply delta t1 there must be a stress of sigma t1 so there must be a stress of sigma t1 after applying delta t2 there must be a stress of sigma t2 so according to this theory if your bitumen is in viscoel linear viscoelastic regime then the final stress after the t2 time the final stress will be the combination of response because of the strain delta t1 because of the strain delta t2 so stresses from the two deformations are additives we can add them subject to a condition they are in linear viscoelastic regime and this holds for any combination of small strains when i say small strain indirectly i am saying that they are in the linear viscoelastic regime so why is this actually important is let us say you have one vehicle coming two vehicles so if you have axle load survey and you have multiple number of vehicles and if you know the amount of strain that is being caused by the particular vehicular load so you can actually use this superposition principle assuming that your material is in linear viscoelastic regime so if you see here for the applied delta t for the applied delta t sigma t is the stress in the first time and sigma t with change in time you can see that sigma t in the t1 to t2 so if you this is the first time strain added to the material as you keep adding the strain to the material you can simply go on adding to the stresses so let us say if you have linear viscoelastic regime material and you know the uh, uh, behavior of that material so if you wanted to understand the behavior of this material under different conditions uh, otherwise if you already have some model uh, for example let us say viscoelastic response of bitumen bg30 i have the viscoelastic response of bitumen bg30 under particular loads let us say 0.1 kilo pascals and 3.2 kilo pascals so if i have some model readily available model based upon the experimental data so in future if somebody have another type of vg30 that means vg30 from another source and if they want to understand the rheological properties of this kind of bitumen 
they don't need to perform all the rheological uh, tests which i have performed because i already have a available model so this is a most uh, useful thing that we need to create a model so that we can avoid this redundant experimental and also beyond the experimental test conditions if we wanted to understand the behavior of the material this models can be used for example maxwell model is one such type of model for linear visco elastic materials especially so in the maxwell model we use a spring and dashboard in the series we know that any two elements which are in series their strains can be additive but their stress is same so i have applied a stress of sigma to these two elements so because spring is a elastic element immediately after applying the stress sigma the strain will be formed which is epsilon 1 and with time epsilon 2 also will be formed we have to add them to get the total strain so and if you wanted the final equation looks like this so there are two conditions for example if we have any material either i can apply a material let us say i can apply stress sigma i can apply a continuous stress on this material that is what called as creep so for one hour i can keep on applying 10 kilo pascals on my material so i am applying some stress sigma for some amount of time then during this time period i can observe how my material is deforming so this experiment is called as creep for a particular period of time we apply some stress then we observe the strain or deformation of the material so what happens because this is visco elastic maxwell model has both spring and uh, dashboard model immediately when i apply the load or stress sigma because spring is present in that immediately there will be a instantaneous strain so this strain is nothing but sigma by e so uh, then if i continue to apply that stress for particular amount of time now because of the dashboard you can see that there will be a increase in the strain then after particular time let us say capital tau i have removed the load that means now the load is zero so immediately what happens because of the spring whatever the initially uh, strain sigma not by e is there that amount will be recovered after recovering then whatever the strain that is left is because of the dashboard usually dashboard is a viscous material if you provide the sufficient amount of time even the dashboard can recover but here instantaneously it cannot recover so here actually the graph should not be like this so it should be like this that means there should be a time dependent recovery usually maxwell model cannot able to capture that behavior here it can able to capture only this instantaneous increase instantaneous drop and this is a permanent deformation which cannot be recovered so thereby the further models have been developed <coughs> so this is one of the type where you sub them subject the material to creep let us say if i don't want to subject my material to the creep i wanted to subject my material to the strain that means let us say you have a material and this material let us say to understand 5 mm is a deformation i wanted to apply 5 mm of deformation to my material so to apply the to create the 5 mm of deformation how much stress it will be required for example here the stress epsilon not is what i am applying on the material so initially what happens initially at t equal to 0 to apply epsilon not strain or let us say this 5 mm uh, deformation i need more stress let us say sigma not stress is required but after particular time what happens you have already given that much of strain to the material now as the time progresses you don't need to have that much sigma not stress or that much load to create the sig- uh, epsilon not so thereby what happens whatever the initial sigma not is there that will keep on relaxes 
that is why this experiment is actually called as relaxation relaxation experiment so either we can subject the material to the strains and observe how it is relaxing initially there must be higher stresses developed but uh, as the time moves that stresses will be released so this is also a Ma maxwell both are in uh, series case so the equations which you have already could have seen but when it comes to the kelvin model the only difference is that both the spring and dashboard they are in parallel so when any two elements when they are in parallel the condition is that like in series uh, strains are ready to here stresses will be ready to but strain of uh, spring and strain of dashboard would be same so using that concept we can actually derive this kelvin model also so in this kelvin model also you will have both creep and also relaxation so creep and relaxation is kind of creep and recovery experiment which we perform on the materials especially using dynamic shear rio metal so we get the data from that experiment using that data we try to uh, fit in this model so so whatever the experimental data i have when i try to use these equations and fit that data if i could able to get the graphs exactly like here these are the theoretical explanations that means the material behavior whatever i have tested in the laboratory is exactly following our theoretical behavior if my data is not following this graphs that means that our model whatever the kelvin model or maxwell model couldn't able to identify the behavior that means we need to modify the existing models that is what if you remember one of the models sir has discussed is generalized model so most of the times the models which i am discussing this maxwell kelvin burgers model these may not able to uh, predict the behavior of our uh, materials because most of the times we use modified bitumens nowadays so their behavior is completely difficult to capture by these models then we might need to use the generalized model we need to add some extra kelvin elements or uh, extra some other elements so that finally we should be able to capture the behavior of the bitumen so in this kelvin model also we have creep experiment where you can see that in the creep same you have applied a constant stress for the duration of time t then what happens strain keep on increases then when you remove the load strain tries to recover so if you compare the maxwell to the kelvin you can see here that the time dependent recovery can be observed here so the kelvin models that means dashboard and uh, spring in parallel condition could able to understand this time dependent recovery that means time dependent recovery of viscous uh, materials but when it comes to the maxwell model it could be able to understand the elastic behavior so one model is uh, uh, giving a better prediction of elastic properties this model is giving a better prediction of viscous properties but our bitumen is a combination of both elastic and viscous properties that is the reason why we have combined both maxwell and kelvin model to get burgers model so in the same way in the relaxation also so in the relaxation experiment you cannot see any relaxation in the kelvin model because here uh, the dashboard and also the if you see the image you will understand here you can see that both dashboard and also the spring both are in parallel so what happens if you wanted to apply a sudden instantaneous strain when i say instantaneous strain that means suddenly at t equal to 0 at t equal to 0 suddenly at the fraction of that 0 seconds i wanted to apply some strain of epsilon not so if you suddenly apply some strain to the dashboard especially it cannot respond because it always responses with time so if they are in series that is not a problem if they are in series if dashboard cannot respond 
either spring could have been responded but when they are in parallel if they have to respond means they both have to respond but this dash part will not allow even the spring to respond if they cannot respond then it cannot even relax so that is the reason why you can see that in the relaxation exp uh, experiment you cannot see any relaxation in the kelvin model so as we discussed so we need the combination of this maxwell maxwell and also kelvin so that it can better understand the viscoelastic properties so we can see here this is a kelvin a kelvin model where the spring and dash part are in parallel and also here spring and dash part are in series so this is a maxwell model this is a kelvin model and we connect this maxwell model and kelvin model in series that is how we got the bergdorf's model so now you can understand this strain behavior exactly the way we wanted so we wanted this initially instantaneous Uh, response this is actually due to the spring and also with the time strain should increase okay this is because of the dash part this is when the load is applied and when the load is removed there should be again instantaneous recovery this is again due to the spring and due to the dash part there must be again time dependent recovery this is again due to the dash part at the end also even uh, after time dependent recovery is done there still will be some amount of strain that is not recovered that is called permanent strain so this is what we are actually expecting from our bitumen so any model if it could able to predict this behavior perfectly that is what we actually wanted so burgess model could able to predict this behavior and as we have already discussed this time dependent recovery this is actually the most important part because this prediction of instantaneous uh, strain and also recovery these two are very easy <coughs> when it comes to the time dependent recovery it is very difficult to understand because if we cannot con uh, consider the time dependent recovery what happens we always tend to estimate the uh, uh, material behavior in a wrong manner let us say if i say my material bitumen one has permanent deformation or rutting of 10 mm this is without considering the time dependent behavior let us say if i consider the time dependent recovery also after 2 years there might be a chance that the rutting is not 10 mm because 3 mm could have been recovered then 7 mm is the rutting so this 3 mm is what time dependent recovery so if you don't consider this 3 mm you always tend to say that your binder is not resistant to not resistant to permanent deformation so we have to consider this time dependent recovery in characterizing the bitumens so existing maxwell and also kelvin models individually they predict the uh, specific type of the behavior kelvin usually uh, is used for this time dependent recovery so in the given amount of time if you have only one kelvin model it is not possible to understand the time dependent recovery thereby you can have a single maxwell model but if you keep adding more kelvin models you will have a better time dependent recovery prediction so this is what we call as generalized model so how do we understand how many kelvin models we need to add is for example uh, let us see initially we will add one maxwell model and one kelvin model which is the burgess model then we we use that uh, stress and strain equation and we already have the experimental data we try to use this uh, equations and plot the graphs if the graphs could able to give the exact uh, prediction which we are expecting then these two uh, elements are enough if they are not predicting the behavior then we will add another element then we will modify our equations accordingly then we will try to fit our experimental data again so in this manner we try to add more kelvin models so that at the end we could be able to better predict our experimental behavior so as we have uh, discussed about linear viscoelastic regime in the same way 
when you are performing the rheological uh, uh, test using especially dynamic shear rheometer the bitumen exhibits time temperature superposition principle so which implies that time am the temperature so if you wanted to understand the behavior of the bitumen at let us say at 30 degrees you have the data if you want to understand at 60 degrees if you don't want to change the temperature but still you wanted to understand the properties of the bitumen at 60 degrees there is a way so at higher temperatures let us say t1 t2 are the temperatures t1 t2 are the times loading times so these are interchangeable let us say at lower temperatures the bitumen is very stiff at lower temperatures the bitumen is very stiff in the same way <coughs> if the loading time is also very small the bitumen is very stiff and if the higher temperatures bitumen is very soft and at the loading time is very long that means vehicle is standing way then also bitumen will be very soft so if you want to understand the properties at higher temperature they would be almost equal to the properties at higher loading times in the vice versa so the responses at lower temperature is similar to the responses at higher frequency high frequency means fast loading rate <coughs> and also the response at higher temperature is similar to the lower frequency and whenever if you wanted to apply this time temperature superposition principle to the material first we need to understand that the material is following simple thermoreological materials property which implies that if you take the bitumen 25 degrees is the intermediate temperature around 100 degrees is where we talk about mixing and compaction and beyond that there will be like 160 150 you will be compacting and less than 25 is what lower temperatures so in this intermediate range bitumen will be in viscoelastic and beyond this 100 degrees and all it will be newtonian it acts like a fluid or liquid so if you see here the properties of bitumen keep on changing from 25 to 100 to 150 and beyond but if you take a particular range let us say 25 to 40 degrees and also if you say 60 to 60 to 100 degrees so in this region their properties are almost similar when i say properties are similar their internal structure will not change so if somebody says they are simple thermoreological materials that means their internal structure should not be varying significantly that implies that then their basic or uh, rheological properties will be constant in that particular temperature range so we need to uh, confirm that the material is simple thermoreological material then only this time temperature superposition principle will be applied so the main uh, equipment is dynamic shear rheometer so if you could see this <coughs> the main concept here is we take a bituminous material and below there will be a base plate and there will be above base plate the above base plate will be rotated this we call as spindle <coughs> using some torque capital T so what happens a spindle will be started here it will go like this then again it will come back from here it will go again like this then it will come back so again it has reached to this position this is called as one cycle so in the same way the using the spindle we will be sharing the materials so as we keep on increasing the number of cycles the bitman would be sheared more so let us see if it is a stress supplied then strain can follow the same path or there can be some lag also so if you see here <coughs> for purely elastic material they are in in phase that means the applied load and the response both will be in the same phase 
so there is no lag between the response that means if i apply load now immediately the material will be responding it will not take but any amount of time to respond it will not be slowly deforming okay that means they are in in phase then we call as phase angle as zero but sometimes what happens after applying a load especially for viscous materials it will take some time and then slowly it will deform in those cases we say that phase angle is 90 degrees but the bitumen which we are talking about is a visco elastic material there the phase angle will be in between 0 to 90 degrees so as we have discussed in the previous slides we need to confirm that the material is in linear visco elastic regime so that in that particular strain only we would be testing our materials so that our time temperature superposition principle boltzmann superposition principle all these things can be applied on the material so how do we know that whether my material is in linear visco elastic regime or not so let us say this is the stiffness of the material so i take some strain so i will apply 1% strain 2% 3% so i am keep on applying the strain on the material and i observe how my stiffness of the material is changing so initially stiffness will be same same so after particular amount of strain my stiffness may be dropped because i am inc increasing the strain so material will become soft its stiffness or modulus will be dropped so let us say 10 mega pascals is initial 10 mega pascals is the initial stiffness so after coming here it has become 9.5 mega pascals at 10% strain that means from 10 it has reduced to just 0.5 mega pascals so here the condition is 95% of the initial value wherever it drops so until the value is 95% of 10 mega pascals this entire range you can use for testing the moment when the stiffness value drops from initial uh, 95% of initial value at that is the boundary beyond that you should not use any strain percent so this strain percentage test is actually called as amplitude sweep so once if we determine the lbe range that is called as determination of lbe range for all the bituminous binders initial test we perform is we have to determine the lbe range so for the test a rheological characterization will be done within that strain percentage only so what are the other tests we perform one is this uh, strain or amplitude sweep this is to identify the lbe range and in addition to that frequency sweep test so when i say frequency sweep test 10 radians per second is one of the frequency let us say this corresponds to 80 kmbh so i wanted to perform my test at 1 radians per second let us say that means i wanted to understand the behavior of the bitumen at less than 80 kmbh so if i know the speed of the vehicle on my road let us say 30 kmbh then i'll convert this 30 kmbh into the corresponding frequency so at that frequency i can actually test my material so when i say frequency sweep we take the binder bitumen we subject this to initially 1% uh, uh, 1 h frequency 2 h frequency like that we keep on increasing the frequency that is called frequency sweep test and that data you can perform at multiple temperature you can perform at uh, 60 degrees 70 degrees etc using that data you can calculate the, you can perform the master curve analysis usually these master curves are uh, generated to understand the behavior of the material beyond the experimental data as i have explained here in the frequency sweep 1 h to let us say 10 h i have performed the data you cannot keep on performing the data till 100 h or 100 radians per second because uh, performing uh, a numerous amount of frequency sweep test is also not possible because one is time constraint and there is equipment limit also so if i have the data with three frequencies let us say and if i wanted to understand the behavior of the material at another frequency let us say 200 radians per second but i do not want to perform the experiment then we can use master curves using master curves we can understand the behavior of the material 
beyond the experimental test conditions. And another is black diagrams. So, these black diagrams and cold cold diagrams are before even using the data. So, after performing the experiment, first we need to confirm whether the material is uh, usually in LVE range or not. One is by LVE test we will perform at that stage. And another is whether there is any discrepancy in the data, whether there is uh, any outliers in the data that needs to be removed that can be confirmed from this black diagrams or cold cold diagrams. Then whatever the outliers or the data that is deviating, we will remove that. Then the remaining data whatever is there will be used for the master curve generation. And another is a temperature sweep. So like in the frequency sweep, te in temperature sweep, we sweep the temperature. That means I start with 48 degrees, 54 degrees, 60 degrees. So we keep changing the temperature of the material in the test condition and we understand its susceptibility to the temperature. So using these are the three very basic rheological tests and using this test what are the data we obtained? We can plot the isochronal plots where in uh, at particular frequency let us say 10 radians per second. If I could have performed at multiple uh, temperature let us say 3 temperatures, how its uh, behavior is changing with temperature and at isothermal plots also at a fixed temperature let us say 60 degrees, at 60 degrees how is the behavior of the material at various frequencies and this master curse as we discussed time temperature superposition principle is applied and the black diagrams is the frequency temperature independent and the cold gold diagrams are the frequency temperature independent. These two are actually before uh, using the data for master curse we use this black and cold gold diagrams. So these are very basic rheological uh, test we perform and uh, before the rheological test have been usually uh, performed in order to grade the bitumen the first grading was based on penetration. So we know the penetration experiment where we apply around that 100 grams of load to this material and we see how much the needle can be penetrated. So before that penetration grade comes the grading was based upon the appearance and solubility. So solubility means uh, it is kind of a purity test ok. We try to dissolve the bitumen and if it could able to dissolve completely we used to think that the bitumen is a good grade. So when you have two kinds of bitumens we try to dissolve separately and see whatever is uh, not getting uh, uh, dissolved properly is not that better grade. And in following uh, grade, uh, grading techniques they have used a chewing technique and also after that we have come with this penetration grading at 25 degrees. So most of the years the penetration grading uh, we used to represent as 30 by 40. Let us say the penetration is 3 to 4 mm. So the disadvantage of this penetration grading is we are performing this test only at one temperature let us say 25 degrees. But in the field uh, in the environment the pavement is subjected to lower temperatures can be less than 25 degrees and at 25 degrees which is intermediate temperature and more than 25 degrees and more than 60 degrees which is a maximum summer temperature. So we are not uh, characterizing the material at a different temperature. We are just characterizing at one temperature and we are actually grading the bitumen and we are using. So any weather with 60 degrees we are uh, choosing same bitumen and uh, any weather with 25 degrees same bitumen. So that is the reason why if you could see three binders of ABC they might have different properties at other temperatures. They may have same property at 25. Then we mistakenly grade them as the same grade so which was wrong. So thereby the and in the further developments usually the viscosity grading has come. So instead of just the penetration which is an empirical test the viscosity of the material at 60 degree has been used as a main criteria. So this 60 degrees was the average maximum surface temperature in United States because this penetration and viscosity and also this super pave temperature grading these have uh, initially been formulated in United States. So if you come to the Indian standard specifications IS, 
So starting from 1950, currently we are in the version of 2013. We are still with the VG grading in India. The PG grading we will discuss so that is uh, available in United States. So main the paving grade started in 1961. So from 1961 to 1992, so the second revision has been done where the two types wax and non wax crude separately we have a table and the third revision 2006 is the when usually we have taken uh, around a decade to come into the viscosity grading system like VG, VG 10 to VG 40 and in the fourth revision uh, it is uh, still based upon the viscosity grading but there are few minor changes from 2006 to 2013. So, if we could see that initial 1992 version, we can see there are a lot of tests to be performed. So, as the number of tests uh, involved is more, it is uh, much difficult for the field practitioners again to uh, grade the bitumen. So, let us say if these 13 tests are need to be done and if I could able to perform only 6 tests and still could able to grade my binder well, then the people would obviously prefer the specification with the lesser. So, as the years pass by you can see in 2006 we have reduced it to 7 and again in 2013 again in the same number but one of the difference from 2006 to 2013 is so even without testing the one of the criteria they have given is if your 7 day average maximum air temperature is less than 30 you can go for VG 30 and if it is more than 45 you can go for VG 40 and if we could see these 7 test here starting with penetration this is the basic test absolute viscosity kinematic viscosity flash point solubility is a purity test and softening point then for short term aged bitumen using RTFO we have to perform this viscosity ratio so viscosity when it is not short term that is unmod uh, unaged binder and also when it is aged in the RTF, the ratio would be calculated and the ductility needs to be performed on short term aged bitumen. So, uh, still we are in that viscosity grading in India and as far as the United States is concerned, we have moved to super pave grading. So, super pave is nothing but the superior performing, superior performing asphalt pavements. So, here this grading we call as PG which means performance graded asphalt binders. So, it was developed in around 1990s. So, the need to develop this super pave grading is the existing specifications for empirical. Still the VG grading or viscosity grading has the viscosity considered at 60 degrees only. It does not consider the testing at other temperatures. And the same test temperatures irrespective of the project location. So, the same 60 degrees is using for all the project locations even though my project location might have different temperature. And in the specifications if you could have seen only RTFO aged or short term aged test are like viscosity ratio and ductility are involved. But what about the long term aged? Long term aging is after 7 to 10 years of the service the bitmen could have been subjected to the long term aging. So, there was uh, no PAV related test and binders can have different temperatures and performance within the same grading system. So, and uh, as far as the viscosity gradings is concerned, till then the research was done only on unmodified bitmen. So, nowadays as the research in modified binders have been predominantly increased, so, this uh, viscosity grading might not be applicable for modified binders thereby a need for super pave grading has been explained. <coughs> you can also see here that uh, uh, there are three types of bitumens which can still have same uh, viscosity range but still they can perform differently at uh, intermediate temperature 60 degrees and 135 degrees. So, this is the one of the reason why we need to understand the behavior of the material at various temperatures to which it is actually subjected to in the field. 
so if you see here so these two are uh, dynamic shear rheometer uh, this is a spindle the sample and the bottom most this is for uh, 25 mm and this is uh, 8 m 8 mm and 25 mm this is to test the material at higher temperatures this arrangement is to test the material at uh, intermediate temperatures and this is a rotational viscometer to test at the more than 100 degrees and this is a direct tension test and we also have a bending beam rheometer these are to test the <coughs> material at lower temperatures so why do we choose this type of loading here is uh, lower temperatures the critical is let us see even if you take the concrete also so at lower temperature what happens material becomes very stiff when it becomes very stiff the critical thing is cracks may form so that why the cracks will form when the material is very stiff and when the wheel load is coming at the top there is a possibility that they can bend when they are trying to bend because the material is very stiff if it is flexible there is no problem they can easily bend if they are not flexible if they are very much stiff there is a chance that from bottom it can start cracking so we have to place our specimen in the lowest temperature and we try to apply the vehicle loader from top and we see how the uh, material is going to fail and in the same way when i apply the tension that means when i it is kind of ductile test right so we try to stretch the material if the material immediately fails that means the material is very brittle in nature we do not want the material to be very brittle especially for lower temperatures because we wanted the material to be very soft very tensile so that it can able to take the load for more amount of time so uh, direct tension test and bending beam rheometer are used for this lower temperature madam uh, sir for a BBR test, the test temperature is fixed or it is to be selected as per the temperature of the location? No, usually, Minimum? Uh, this is the lowest temperature we need to usually select. But yeah. uh, uh, what the code specifies is if you select the lowest temperature, you need to perform for two hours the test. Huh. But performing for two hours, uh, people have found it difficult. That is the reason why in order to simulate the same behavior, let us say if the temperature to be performed is let us say minus 20 degrees so but two hours you have to perform still if you want to perform within 60 seconds then the code suggests you can add 10 degrees that means you perform at a minus 10 degrees and take the data at 60 seconds so here they are applying this time temperature superposition principle so the behavior of minus 20 can be achieved at minus 10 given within 60 seconds. So they will give the lowest temperature. We increase 10 degrees to that lowest temperature and we perform the BBR test. Okay. That means to reduce the test timing, mm. you can take the this uh, advantage of this 10 degrees Celsius. 10 degrees. Okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you. And if you see the rutting, so we basically have three types of failures on the pavement that we know one is rutting, another is fatigue and another is thermal or temperature cracking. Rutting occurs at higher temperatures, let us say around 60 degrees and more than 60 degrees. Fatigue or cracks occurs at intermediate temperatures around 25 degrees and these thermal crackings are lower temperatures, it will be lesser temperatures it can be less than 10 degrees and negative temperatures also so if i want my bitumen to be our bitumen to be stiff at more than 60 and also it should be flexible at 25 degrees also and it should be more flexible at lower temperatures it is a kind of balanced uh, mix design kind of concept where our material should perform well at all kind of temperature not just higher temperatures not just lower temperatures so if you take the rutting so, uh, rutting is a problem initially when you laid the pavement, the mix will be kind of uh, loose. When the vehicle starts moving upon that, mix, uh, mix will be getting compacted. Then after that, when the vehicle continuously moves over that uh, pavement, 
the deformation keep on getting accumulated so this period is unaged and also short term aged period so we need to perform the test on unaged and also short term aged binders but if you take about the long term aged binders what happens after 3 years of service bitumen will already become very strong or very stiff so at that time uh, the stiffness means the resistance is already increasing then uh, the resistance of rutting no need to check because at uh, uh, long term aged binders the stiffness is inbuilt increases but initially that stiffness will not be there so we need to perform the rutting test on unaged and also short term aged binders and the test temperature is 7 day maximum average uh, temperature and uh, according to the specifications they uh, suggest that if you perform the test at 10 to 12% strain rate the bitumen will be in linear viscoelastic regime and minimum of 1 kilo pascals of uh, stiffness needs to be maintained if you perform on unaged binder and minimum 2.2 kilo pascals if you perform on rtf aged binder and if you take the fatigue behavior or cracking so we perform this on long term aged because fatigue or cracks are problem when the bitumen is too stiff when the bitumen will be too stiff after particular amount of years so in initial for 3 4 years the bitumen will not be that much stiff because uh, that is the initial stages when the vehicles are moving slowly the mixture will be subjected to the uh, oxidation process slowly it gets becoming stiffer and stiffer so after particular amount of service let us say 4 5 years bitumen will become very stiff that is when when you keep on applying wheel loads over the pavement but uh, pavement cannot bend properly because it is very stiff it is not flexible then cracks will start forming from bottom and they will be propagating to the top so long term aged binders are very much critical for the fatigue so we perform the test on long term aged binders so at what temperature we need to perform so let us say 64 is a maximum pg grade minus 12 is the minimum so intermediate temperature usually we, we thought that 64 minus 12 by 2 this is the average so this must be the temperature at which we have to perform but the research has shown that so in addition to the 64 minus 12 will be 52 by 2 which is 26 but they suggest you add 4 degrees extra that means 30 degrees is your ideal condition to test the intermediate temperature test or fatigue test and as the bitumen is very stiff now we, there is a chance that uh, you cannot apply more strains if you apply more strains then there is a chance to go into the non linear regime so they suggest 1% strain and pav aged is nothing but the long term so here we limit the maximum stiffness because we say that stiffness should be always less than 5000 because the bitumen should be as soft as possible at Uh, this uh, intermediate temperatures so we take the bitumen we try to maintain minimum stiffness for the rutting resistance we limit the maximum stiffness for the fatigue resistance for example if you take this bending beam rheometer which is for uh, lower temperatures it is to test the affinity to lower temperature cracking then uh, we apply a continuous loading which is nothing but the creep loading on a bituminous beam we have selected beam because the main phenomena of cracking in uh, lower temperature and also intermediate temperatures mostly is by bending if bitumen can bend very easily uh, with more flexibility there is no possibility of any crack actually if it cannot bend that is a problem that is this is the worst condition that is the reason why we wanted to test in the form of beam so we apply a load for 240 seconds and then creep stiffness is calculated at 60 seconds here the two parameters that needs to be considered is one is creep stiffness and another is m value so m is nothing but the slope so how the stiffness is changing with time so we want if the stiffness is not changing much with time that means stiffer material is always behaving stiffer it is taking two days to become soft so we do not want that kind of material because we want the material to change from higher stiffness to lower stiffness quickly especially at lower temperatures not at the higher temperatures 
so this slope should be varying so quickly so m should be more so that the bitumen can be very uh, satisfied uh, satisfactorily can perform in the lower temperatures so as we have discussed uh, if we cannot perform the test for uh, two hours then from the lowest temperature we can actually increase 10 uh, degrees so that the 60 seconds the data can be used and if you see the direct tension test let us say there are few materials uh, just like polymer modified binders so polymer modified binders what happens is at lower temperatures so if you keep uh, applying the load of tension let us say they will not break they are like elastic band but still they are stiffer at lower temperature still they cannot break so they are not brittle but still they are uh, their stiffness is more but still they can have higher elasticity or tensile properties so for those kind of materials if you wanted to understand their properties at lower temperatures this direct tension test can be used so this is the shape in which we prepare the uh, uh, bitumen sample then we try to apply the tension on both the sides and we see when this length can be broken so the corresponding failure strain can be calculated and a minimum failure strain of 1% can be minimum we have to use the 1% because previously at lower temperatures we do not want our strain to be more than 1% because we assume that the bitumen may fail but polymer modified binders even though their stiffness is more they will not fail at uh, higher strains more than 1% in those cases we can still actually use stains more than 1%. And this is uh, one of the sample usually in the PG grading. So, this is for uh, rutting. So, you can see in the rutting, G star by sign. So, this is a flash point. This we already know. Viscosity, that also we already know. And the main thing is this G star by sign delta at 10 radians per second we will be performing and we will see let us say at 52 degrees we will test the bitumen in dynamic shear rheometer for g star by sine delta and if its value is minimum 1 kilo pascal we can grade it as pg 52 no doubt if it is no, uh, less than 1 kilo pascal then we can test at 58 6 degrees is the gap then we will check in the same way g star by sine delta can be checked for rtfo samples that means short time measured samples and if the value is 2.2 kilo pascals minimum that means if at 50 de 52 degrees if the bitumen can able to have the stiffness of 2.2 kilo pascals that means that bitumen can resist the rutting so same things can be performed for long term aged uh, binders that means pav aged binders then we will understand g star into sine delta value and these are the lower temperature usually this lower temperature test bbr and uh, dan, uh, direct tension test we will not perform in india we perform only the intermediate and higher temperatures because those two are the critical for us so let us say if i could have performed all the rheological properties on the uh, bitumen and if somebody comes to us and asks that uh, so let us say we have already designed the payment and they ask that how much confidence you have that uh, your bitumen will uh, your payment will not fail are you confident of 95 percent or 50 percent so we do not consider this reliability in the design but we consider this uh, reliability even at the stage of the selection of test temperature so for example when i say pg 58 so this 58 degrees I can either choose let us say 56 degrees so 56 degrees let us say at this temperature my g star by sine delta is minimum 1 kilo pascal so then I can choose 56 degrees as 50 percent reliability let us say if I design for 60 degrees that means it is coming around let us say 98 percent reliability so for any pavement 
If I assume only 56 degrees temperature will be coming in summer and design, that is a 50 percent reliability. But if I want to be more on safe side, I can choose 60 degrees and design for 98 percent reliability. So, at the initial stages of selecting the test temperature itself, we include our reliability. So, that in whatever the calculations we are doing and the behavior analysis that we are doing, we are doing already for the safest side. So, this is same as the previous one. So, so one of the advancement in addition to this uh, dynamic shear test G star by sin delta is this G star by sin delta uh, research has been performed only for unmodified binders. For modified binders, the main difference is time dependent recovery. Unmodified binders, even if you give uh, let us say one year or two year, the amount of strain recovered might not be that much uh, uh, varied. But for modified binders, if you keep giving uh, the allowable time, then the strain can be recovered more and the rutting resistance can be increased. So, in order to understand this uh, time dependent recovery, one of the most important test is multiple stress creep and recovery has been come where let us say you have a binder initially you apply let us say 0.1 kilo pascal load then you will give some rest again you will apply 0.1 kilo pascal uh, stress to the material then you will give load uh, rest then we will observe that when i apply this 0.1 kilo pascal how the strain is increasing then when i remove what is happening how it is recovering again i will apply then how strain is increasing then after removing how it is recovering. So, it is not just the 0.1 kilo Pascal, again we try to apply 3.2 kilo Pascals also and then we try to understand the behavior of the material. So, we assume that this 0.1 kilo Pascals is the lowest stress level. So, the material is still in the linear uh, range, but this 3.2 kilo Pascals is we intentionally wanted the material to undergo the damage, enter into the non-linear uh, behavior and see how much it can actually recover. So, that whatever the unrecorded portion can be removed and whatever is a record portion can be calculated. So, MSCR test was the development uh, taken uh, and uh, in around 2021 this uh, code has been updated in which MSCR uh, criteria has been included. So, in the MSCR the main criteria is JNR non-recoverable creep compliance. So, how much is the amount of strain that is not recovered? So, we wanted the material to have least unrecovered strain. So, based on that JNR, usually this uh, PG plus specification has been come. Remaining all uh, will be the same except that the MSCR criteria needs to be calculated for grading the bitumen. So, here the grading will not change much. Let us say if the grading previously is PG 56 minus 12. So, in addition to that either you will add S, H, V, E. So, when I say S that means this bitmen can be used only for standard traffic and this can be used for heavier traffic. So, the traffic list has been given in the code. So, only so if you wanted to use your bitmen for higher traffic then you need to go for the any PG grading with uh, E, E as a grading that can be used. And if you could see few questions, so these are very basic questions. The first one is in the Maxwell model, so Max, when I say Maxwell model that means spring and dash pot, both are in series. When something is in series, what happens? Strain will be sum of the spring and stress. stress. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, here they are saying that total stress is equal to the sum of the stresses. This is wrong. During the creep experiment, when the load is removed, there is an instantaneous strain equal to the stress. Yes, this is correct. So, this is the stress supplied and when the load is removed, what happens? There will be instantaneous this instantaneous drop will be there that is what they are telling so this is correct 
strain is equal to the sum of the strain in the both the elements. So, both B and C is the correct answer. The absolute viscosity of the bitumen can be obtained from dynamic shear rheometer as if you could have remembered there is absolute viscosity so this uh, in one of the lectures that has been discussed that so the total viscosity as a function of storage and loss viscosity. So, this uh, ratio of loss modulus and angulus, uh, angular frequency, loss modulus and the angular frequency is what we call as absolute viscosity of the absolute viscosity of the absolute viscosity of the bitumen. So, it is enough to understand this the ratio of loss modulus and angular frequency. So, while plotting a master curve of complex modulus versus reduced time the shift factors at temperatures higher than the reference temperature are. So, let us say when we are plotting a master curve let us say stiffness is on y axis and you have frequency or time on x axis. So, this is so at lower temperature stiffness will be higher at higher temperature stiffness will be lower. Let us say 40 degrees is our reference temperature. So, here they are asking that while plotting a master curve of complex modulus this stiffness is nothing but the complex modulus versus reduced time let us say this is reduced time the shift factor at temperatures higher than reference temperatures. So, 60 degrees is higher than reference temperature. Now, what I have to do? I have to shift my 60 degrees to the right side that is on to the 40 degrees then what I should do? If your temperature is higher then your shift factor will be less than 1. If your temperature is lower your shift factor will be more than 1. So, here your temperature is higher than the reference temperature which implies the shift factor is less than 1. The following test is not available in the Indian standard 73-2013. So, in the IS 73 we already have purity test which is nothing but the solubility test. A long term aging of bitumen. Mm, long term aging is uh, not included in the IS 73. And this is the easy question. The specified criteria to control the fatty cracking is uh, G star sin delta into G star sin delta what? G star into what? for fatty cracking it should be G star by uh, G star into sin delta should be less than 5000 kilo Pascal. And this creep stiffness in BBR test is usually calculated at 60 seconds. That is it. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? What is this BBR? BBR, uh, you what you are calling BBR test? Bending beam rheometry. So, in the bending beam rheometer test, so for how much time we apply the load? And at the end, we take the creep stiffness, let us say, the creep slope and also creep stiffness, we calculate. So, this graph, if you remember, so here at 60 degrees, we actually consider the data. So, they are asking this creep stiffness in BBR test is calculated at what time? at 60 seconds. So, we perform test for entire 240 seconds 
and we consider this uh, after one second or 60 seconds the data then that data is considered to calculate the creep stiffness and also the slope. Uh, madam, uh, can you please explain this, how to calculate this uh, absolute viscosity from the G-star, whether G-star is a complex shear modulus, no? No, G-star is a complex shear modulus. Yeah. So, if they could have given G-star or complex shear modulus, huh. and if they could have given, let us say, G-star by omega, let us say. 10 mega pascals, let us say they have given by omega is frequency. So, hmm. omega is nothing but 2 pi f frequency. So, 2 pi into frequency, if they could have given directly, we can use. If they, if they don't give, frequency is nothing but 1 by time. Hmm. Either they will give the time or they will give the frequency. So, if they give frequency, we can directly substitute the f. If they give time, we have to inverse the time and use it here. Let us say if 1 hertz is the frequency, then omega will be 2 pi into 1, that is just 2 pi. So, 2 pi. Mm -hmm. 2 pi hertz. So, hertz is nothing but cycles per second. So, this will be 10 mega pascals by 2 pi. So, if you do the calculation, 10 by 2 is 5. So, 5 by pi mega pascals is the viscosity. Now, what is the significance of giving that uh, phase angle delta? Where's, oh, phase angle where sir? Delta, delta. Uh, here sir or in this? Del, del represents uh, I think uh, which one is phase na? Hmm. Here in this problem we have not given the delta sir. Uh, in one of the uh, in our assignment madams. Mm, okay assignment question. So, yeah, yeah. usually uh, they will give because if they could not have given you this uh, G double prime or loss modulus, let me explain. Okay. So, G star equal to G prime plus G double prime. Hmm. So, storage plus loss modulus. Uh, storage plus loss modulus. So, okay. sometimes what happens, they will not directly give this loss modulus. Uh -huh. Then we have to calculate the loss modulus. Hmm. So, G star into sine delta. Loss modulus equal to G star into sine delta. Okay. Storage modulus equal to G star into cos delta. So, in that case, you can directly calculate the 10 mega pascals into sine of whatever delta they have given. This you don't need to calculate also because we just need the loss modulus only. Okay. If they directly give this, no problem. The G double prime, if they don't give this G star into sine delta, we calculate then divided by omega as we have discussed, it can be 2 pi f. Then we will get the dynamic or absolute viscosity. So, here in this question, they are directly asking absolute viscosity is a ratio of loss modulus to angular frequency. So, to represent clearly loss modulus is G double prime divided by frequency is omega. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, sir. Okay, sir, then we can close the meet. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Yeah.